My name is Theodis Bunch and I work for the Natural Resource Conservation Service and I'm headquartered at the uh, National Water Management Center in Little Rock. Uh, we'd like to take this up, well, we'll serve as your facilitator this morning. Uh, we'd like to take this opportunity to thank you for coming to the workshop and to welcome you here. Uh, the previous workshop, there was a whole lot of talk about farmer school, seasonal high tone production. So hopefully we're gonna bring it full circle in this, this next hour or so. We got two presenters that's gonna come before us today, but before we get to that point, uh, make sure those, everyone, a little housekeeping stuff, everyone that came in do have a ticket. If you don't have a ticket, raise your hand. I've uh, got a young lady here helping me, Miss Casey Wright, and she's passing those out, so we have door prizes. So if you want to participate in a door prize drawing, please, please raise your hand and get a ticket. Also, I want to acknowledge uh, Mrs. Bryant. Where are you, Mrs. Bryant? There she is. She's going to help us with the AV situation here. Make sure that our laptop is working, our computer is working. And I understand we may or may not use that. But Dr. Collie, you want it, don't you? OK, all right, good. All right, so anyway, we have two speakers, like I said, this morning that's going to help us out this morning. And uh, I got bios on both speakers. So what I will do is take a few minutes to uh, read those bios, and then we'll bring them up one by one. We want them to come up and present to you, and then allow opportunities for you to ask questions. We like that interaction, that dialogue, so that we all can leave here with the same understanding. So with that being said, um, one, one point or two I want to make in terms of uh, USDA programs. All of you in here, well most of you in here, probably at some point in time, if you're in the production arena, has gone into a USDA office to participate in one of those programs. And what we're going to learn in this session is about the seasonal high tunnel program, how it's working, how it's impacting the community in which our presenter is, is living in and also working in. So we will learn those impacts. We're also going to learn about another program, brand new program I'm calling it, since 2010 maybe, the USDA Farm to School Program. Taking these locally grown produce, getting them integrated into the school systems so our little babies can have healthy, nutritious food to eat throughout the day. And so we hope to learn a lot today, so get your minds in gear, and once the opportunity comes to ask questions, feel free to do so. Okay, with that being said, I'm going to get into my introductions now, and then we'll bring our speakers up. So make sure you get a ticket, though, if you want to participate in the door prize, okay? All right, um, to talk to us today about a farmer school program, we have Mrs. Evelyn Rayford, and she holds a Bachelor of Science degree in Institutional Dietetics, <coughs> from a and &E College, now the University of Arkansas at Pine Bluff. And she also holds a master's degree in public health nutrition administration from the University of Tennessee at Knoxville. Uh, she's been employed uh, with the Corporate Extension Service and the Expanded Food and Nutrition Education Program for Phillips, Lafayette, and Miller Counties. Uh, she's taught school, science, was a science teacher at Cotton Plant, all places, great place to teach. Cotton Plant in Texas County School District. Uh, she worked for the Miller County uh, Mental Health Center as a psychosocial program coordinator. You can talk to me afterwards about that. Uh, <laughs> she presently is a child nutrition director for the Forest City School District at Forest City. And as director, she feeds over 3,200 students two meals per day, plus after school snacks for approximately 900 students daily. She's a member of the Taylor Chapel Christian Methodist Episcopal Church at Forest City. She has two sons, two daughters-in-laws, and four grandchildren. And, one and, and, she, and she's got a quote here that I think is very, very important that we all hear, and I want to share that quote with you. She said, I'm deeply troubled when I see a hungry child. It also touched my spirit when I see parents in the grocery store with shopping carts full of empty calorie and high-sodium foods because these foods do not supply the child with the nutrients needed to support growth, provide much needed building blocks for the child's young body. I pay attention to the children as they come through the breakfast and lunch lines at school and hear them ask the question, what is that? <laughs> Common foods that have been around for centuries, yet we find our children have never seen or heard of them in their homes. I became interested in the farm school program when I was introduced introduced, when it was introduced to me, at a child nutrition workshop. Since that time, I have worked to incorporate fresh fruits, 
vegetables and the breakfast and lunch plates in the Forest City School District, end quote. And that's Mrs. Evelyn Brayford. Let's give her a round of applause. And our last presenter is, is going to talk about the seasonal high tunnel production program. And that's Dr. Barry Colley. Uh, Dr. Colley has a PhD in agriculture and extension education from Michigan State University. Dr. Colley serves small farmers around the world in a variety of settings. During the Great Famine of Ethiopia in the 1980s, 85 through 88, he directed irrigation projects and input supply packages of seeds, oxen, and tools to help displaced farmers resettle after, after abandoning their land. In the early 1990s, he directed a demonstration farm in East Arkansas and directed farmers to farmer network training and demonstration. These activities assisted African-American farmers in Arkansas to make the transition from traditional row crops to alternative high-value vegetable crops. Currently, he's the CEO of Seven Harvest Incorporated, which is a nonprofit co-founded by Mr. Oh, Dr. Collin and his wife, Diane. Under the direction of Dr. Collins, Seven Harvest operates a food enterprise incubator center comprising an administrative office, a commercial training farm that produces vegetables in seasonal high tunnels and in the field with raised beds under black plastic mulch and drip <coughs> irrigation. A mini pack house unit provides safe conditions to clean, rinse, grade, pack, and cool vegetables in, walk -in, in a walk-in cooler. In 2014, Seven Harvest, as a member of the Arkansas Delta Seeds of Change Coalition, is striving to put more money in farmers' and producers' pockets, put more money in farmers' and producers' pockets by organizing effective farm business cooperatives, accessing and supplying farm to school markets in eastern Arkansas and Shelby County, Tennessee, and also increasing the production of year-round quality vegetables for seasonal high tunnels. This presentation, the point I want to make, will outline the strengths, the weaknesses, the opportunities, and the threats of year-round production with seasonal high tunnels. With anything that's new, folks, there are some challenges, but there are also opportunities. And I think that's what Dr. Carly is going to share with you today. So let's welcome Dr. Carly's point. Good morning. Okay. Good morning. Good morning. It is so good to see each of you. Um, first, this is my first time ever presenting a workshop, so you all bear with me. Um, I uh, chart, all I do now is do what? No, it's, it's coming back. It's coming back, it's back power up. up, yeah. Okay. Sleep mode. As they said, I am from Forest City, the uh, Forest City School District, where we feed 3,200 kids breakfast and lunch. We are a district that is 82%, 82% free and reduced. So we are a very high poverty district. And our children, our children are missing out on a lot of good nutrition that is coming from their homes. But we as a school district, is doing our very best to incorporate fruit and vegetables into the children's diet. We have also incorporated a fresh fruit and fresh fruit and vegetable grant along with the farm to school where we get approximately $132,000 a year to feed our children a mid-afternoon snack of fresh fruit and vegetables. So this is working very well within this high poverty area as well. So we, at the Forest City School District, made a decision in 2012 that we were going to start working with the children in the Forest City Schools with farm to school. When it was first uh, introduced to us, it was introduced to us by someone coming from the state of Florida to bring produce to Forest City, Arkansas. And I didn't like that. 
And I said, there has to be someone in Arkansas that can provide fruit and vegetables to the, for the Arkansas schools. Well, when I, I canceled him this year, and I said, I will find what I need in the state of Arkansas. So I got in touch with East Arkansas Enterprises. And I said to them last summer, I need some vegetables in the Forest City Schools because we serve about 1,300 kids per day during our summer program. And I said, we need vegetables. So someone from East Arkansas Enterprises came along and she said, Iris said, Ms. Rayford, I have some squash. I said, okay, bring the squash. Ms. Rayford, I found some tomatoes. Bring the tomatoes. Ms. Rayford, I found some corn. Bring the corn. And everything she located, we used. Ms. Rayford, I found some watermelons. Bring the watermelons. And one of the things that we want you to understand as farmers, that it is not just vegetables, it's fruit also. So if you have strawberries, if you have plum trees, if you have cherry trees, if you have any of these things, contact us. We can help you. Okay, uh, am I ready? Not yet. Not yet. <laughs> okay, uh, I'll probably be through by the time it gets there. Um, USDA, I don't know if, ne I don't know, am I being recorded? I don't know necessarily <laughs> if I care too much for some of the things that USDA does because they have a tendency to do things that don't give you any money to do it with. And they don't make sure that you are able to fulfill the obligations that they throw upon you. And I'm from an old rural school district. You tell me I need fresh fruit and vegetables, but I don't have a place to store a lot of fresh fruit and vegetables. And when you bring enough to feed 3,200 kids a day, five days a week, what do I have to have? A place to put it, where it is going to be safe for the children. So USDA, you need to help us out. We need a place to store refrigeration, to store fresh fruit and vegetables. We don't want these farmers to go out here and produce all this stuff because they can't bring it to me every day five days a week. I do a cycle menu, and then I give this cycle menu to that farmer. Because that farmer is telling me that I'm going to provide you with cucumbers. I'm going to provide you with watermelons. I'm going to provide you with apples. I'm going to provide you with cucumbers. I'm going to provide you with what green beans, okay? I'm going to provide you with green. So if you tell me that, you come to my office and I give you a copy of my menu. So whenever you see greens on that menu, you better get me some greens. If you promise me, you heard the two farmers say here a minute ago, that if you have a market and you see on Wednesday that I need 87 pounds of greens, and they need to go to five different schools, you need to get them there, okay? And that's what we need. So we need you to be able on the day that you say that you're going to get them to me, to have them to me. Now, I know the first thing you want to hear is how much you pay. I don't know what the market is, but we get on that computer and go and find the market value of the product for that week. Because produce is priced every week. 
it is not priced. We bid out our, a lot of our food to commercial vendors. Well, they can tell us what they are going to pay us for a can of green beans. And I'm going to get that case of green beans for the same price every year, every, every, all the year, okay? But if you tell me that you have something fresh, you can't set a price like that. And don't you let any food service director tell you you can. Because you can't. So I know that you and I have to sit down, look at that price, and I say, okay, I will pay you $2.89 a pound for this. Whatever that market says, that's what we will pay. Because it's fresh, it's perishable, and I guarantee you that that came from Cuba, from Guatemala, I'm paying more of that, and they pick it raw, and they pick it, uh, what's, what's my word? Green. Uh, green. They pick it green, and it ripens on the way. You are bringing me fresh produce, and I want to, I hope we'll get ready to see some of the beautiful produce that we have received. So as we work to use the items that you present to us, then we can go forward and sell the items, buy, purchase the items from you, and use them for our students. Does everyone have a handout? Mm -hmm. Not everybody is supposed to for our city can negotiate with you. Do you know if other food service directors, or can you tell people how to work with other food service directors? Hmm. People. Now everybody's not as kind and sweet as I am. <laughs> <laughs> but they are authorized through the Department of Education Child Nutrition Unit in Little Rock, Arkansas to work with you. And when you go and see that food service director or child nutrition director, and they tell you that they don't want to, you get on that phone, write this number down. <laughs> write this number down. <laughs> Area code 501. 9502 and speak to Suzanne Davison, S-U-Z-A-N-N-E, 87501-324-9502. Suzanne Davison or Sheila Brown. You tell them that that food service director in Plum Nelly County <laughs> will not work with you. <coughs> this is a mandate, and we have to. Now, one of, a person in our area said that she didn't want to serve sweet potato because it was too much weight. I said to her, wait, you get that every day. <laughs> What's the difference between throwing away a sweet potato Throwing away a piece of white bread. It's still going in the trash. But eventually, she will try it, he will try it, and he'll like it. How, do, how long, how many times do you have to try something before you like it? You have to try it over and over and over until your taste buds get used to it. Babies, and you know, I'm not so interested in the teenagers. Because teenagers have an attitude. <laughs> Start with the baby. Start with the baby. I have an ABC school that has 270 three, four, and five year olds. 
Two years ago, several of those kids said they had never had a salad. Three-year-olds just starting to school said they'd never had a salad. I can't keep them from eating salad now. Start with the baby. And when they get to high school, they'll still have attitude. But they will take the product. And they will like the product. The only thing that I have served them that they wouldn't eat, and they told me not to ever bring it back, was acorn squash. <laughs> now, I figure we messed up the cooking process. Now, that's what I figure. But I'm going to get with uh, Ms. Griggs, and she's going to help me figure out how to cook this, this uh, zucchini squash and acorn squash and Hubbard squash. And we are going to get these kids to eating this. Because you see, I have my children eating cauliflower, thinking it's mashed potatoes. <laughs> they don't know. You doctor it up, they don't know. Okay? Farm to school is it, y'all. It is it. So, but now what I need from you, what I need from you, is I need a commitment from you, and this is what every child nutrition director needs, is a commitment from you that says, Ms. Rayford, I plant blackberries. And my blackberry season, like the farmer said, my blackberry season is from here to here. And I, am, I can go out there and pick these blackberries, and I can bring them to you. See, one thing about fruit and vegetables, you can say a soy. I don't have to put on that menu that I'm serving blackberries today, I'm serving peaches today, I'm serving this today. All, you, all child nutrition and USDA want to know is that I gave those kids a half a cup of fruit today. And I gave the high school kids a cup of fruit a day. Now, mathematician, if I have 3,200 kids, and every day I have to give a half a cup or a cup, how much money is that going in your pocket? Quite a bit of money, isn't it? Every day, every day. And the regs have changed. And next year, I will have to give a half a cup of fruit, not juice, for breakfast. So that's putting more money in your pocket. I'm also going to have to give vegetables for breakfast, OK? So that means that I've got to come up with some kind of hash brown potato. I can't just now give a donut. But I didn't get donuts anyway. <laughs> I gave them eggs. And <laughs> but uh, so we things are changing. And it's changing for the benefit of you. If you're growing something, the school can use it. You know, there are people out there that have pomegranate trees, and they are feeding the pomegranates at all. Do you all know children love pomegranates? <laughs> what is a pomegranate? Is that old fruit with all the little nuts, all the little seeds in it? And it puffers when you eat it? Yes, and they love it. So don't feed the pomegranates to the hall. <laughs> That's growing out wild out there on the tree. Pick it. Research it. Very expensive. Take it to the school. The kids love it. They will eat it. Watermelon. Arkansas is watermelon heaven. 
How many watermelons did y'all sell up? <laughs> I didn't buy enough. I did not buy a watermelon off of a truck coming from Benny Keith or Cisco or anywhere this year, this year. And they are planning to have strawberries for me in May or whenever. I will not buy a strawberry from a commercial vendor. <coughs> if they tell me they can provide me with the strawberries, I'm getting them from them. And you all, we have plum trees. We have, Arkansas is varied. Don't, th don't just think peaches and apples and oranges. Let your mind soar. If you can grow it, we can serve it. <coughs> now, the one thing you have to do, you have to make sure it's safe. <coughs> Follow all your rules and regulations. Now, I will come out to your farm, walk your farm, look at where, where, what you're doing, because the one thing I do not want to see is your porta potty <laughs> or no porta potty. <laughs> okay? It has to be in the right place. Your son or your daughter cannot be taking care of their business while they're picking. Okay? So make sure that you are following all the guidelines for safety. It is not, it really is not rocket science. Now, we would like to have it packaged to us in anywhere from 70 to 100 servings in just large spillable bags that have temperature. We would like that because, again, we do not have a lot of storage space. So we need you to bring it to us in a way that I don't just have to have just so many bags. Because when I have a school that has 900 kids there, I have to have 900 half cup servings, okay? I have to have 900 fourth cup servings if I'm going a fourth cup. But I have to be able to provide what is needed. Um, in your hand, you have a non-negotiable contract. This is the inf some of the information that you need to get to me. And you all, we can do this. We can do this and we can make this happen. All you have to do is call me. I, I'm one of these crazy people that don't bring cards, but my number if I can help you with any contact information of getting in touch with your food service director, if I can help you, you can call me at 870-633-5668, extension 139. 870. 633-5668, extension 139. Mr. Bunch has told me that my time is up. I'm sorry my uh, presentation wasn't ready. But uh, you might highlight that it does display how you like to receive it. Okay, but everything is in this packet. Let's give Ms. Rayville a hand. Please. Good to be with friends and family. Uh, I, I'm not going to go around the room and acknowledge everybody because I might miss somebody, but I think uh, when I came to Arkansas from Minnesota back in around 92, 93, the uh, person that got me straight on what's happening in Arkansas with farmers is Mr. Thomas Vaughn in the back. So I just wanted to acknowledge him. and. Uh, Uh, a gracious man, patient, and a good teacher. So, here I am, 2014. 
and uh, I'm still experimenting. I'm getting older, but my mind is still growing. I want to say to this lady, uh, Ms. Rayford, she's the most dynamic uh, food administrator in any district in the Mid-South, because this woman, <laughs> Seven Harvest, one of our major crops or enterprises is the spring mix. I used to call it salad mix, but the, the trade name now is spring mix. So I had to educate myself to say spring mix. You're always changing. Business is always changing. We were interested in serving students with this delicious spring mix. We have a special, it's not proprietary, but we, we integrate a lot of good nutritional leafy greens and lettuces. And um, so we, we had the idea, I think we, we Somehow we talked to, when the farm to school business first came out, hit, hit the streets, so to speak. We approached uh, Ms. Rayford about selling to the school. Bring me a sample, she said. That was a quick response. We brought her a sample. She liked what she saw. She took it home and tried it herself, as I remember. You correct me if, I know you will. <laughs> uh, and so she tried it. And then she wanted to try it in, the, I think, the high school and in the elementary school. So we brought these, we brought, I don't know, maybe five pounds of salad mix. So once we tried it and there was interest in it, then we tried to talk about price. And that's where things fell apart. Because we were used to getting, for a half a pound, $5. Even to our direct customers. And if we sold it uh, to a uh, grocery store, we would probably get about three twenty-five. And at that time, Ms. Rayford could only pay us a dollar, equivalent of a dollar sixty-seven. Now I'm a small farmer. Even though I have uh, my farm is a commercial teaching farm, but we try to teach by operating as as a commercial enterprise. That wasn't good economics for us. It wasn't good finance for us. So we, we just kind of drifted away. But a year or two later, with the ADSOC, Arkansas Delta Seeds of Change Coalition, uh, heightened interest in uh, vegetables and growing locally and getting our children more healthy, uh, we did a little research. We got a little assistance and now the prices are much better and we are about to embark on this year with the salad mix and customize it for her you know customize means you give them exactly what they want so we want only green lettuces no reds no purples green is that right Miss Rayford because that's what her that's what the market requires Although we traditionally mix, we have nice, beautiful colors. We have, you know, pungent, soft greens and all of that. She wants these, a couple of different kind, kinds of lettuces and leafy, not head. So we have customized our operation to fit the farm to school. The biggest thing about farm to school, I think, is sizing your units so that when it comes to the school, it's immediately usable. They don't have to do any extra food preparation because they, they don't have much time. They got to feed so many kids in such amount of time. So, you know, it requires us to understand what's going on, what the dynamic is in the cafeteria. And I do know that Ms. Rayford had, I assume it was some resistance from her team uh, initially, and she stood her ground. And so this is where we are now. So I, I really appreciate working with this particular woman in this particular setting. And uh, I'll get on to my presentation. Seasonal high tunnels. Seasonal means you can grow in cold weather, hot weather, fall and spring, okay? Without mechanical heating 
or cooling. Would it be better if the lights would be? Um, I guess it would be a little. Uh, yeah, just I think that's okay. All right, so this is. You come up to our operation, this is what you'll see, the, uh, the signpost outside, the two and a half acres of growing area that Seven Harvest has. We like to think that we're a teaching, a teaching farm, um, but it is important for us to see profitability in what we're doing so that we can pass it on to people we're trying to train. We've had ex-offenders come out to our place and work. We've had veterans. We've had uh, folks that have dropped out of school. We've had college students. We've had, uh, I've had a couple of my grandchildren out there. And they try to take advantage of grandpa, but straighten it out. Farm to school markets, benefits to schools. I'm not gonna spend too much time on this because I don't have much time, but benefits to school year round, locally grown vegetables. We know that locally grown probably has less bad things in it, pesticides. If it's locally grown and they don't have to travel far, it's gonna be fresh, and it's gonna have less of a chemical content. Improved quality and freshness. Our salad mix is locally grown. When we take it into Memphis or Eastern Arkansas, folks always tell us it lasts so much longer. If I open up a bag of commercial mix from Walmart, as soon as I open it, I have to use it in one setting, else it, it, it's not there tomorrow. And I haven't eaten it. I've just wasted my food dollars, right? So this is the situation. Improved uh, nutrition for children. My little anecdote to that is that stunting, when a child is growing, and if they're stunted, they don't recover. It's not something they can recover from. And stunting is not only physical, it is also mental. And I haven't seen it too much of it here in the US, but I've seen it in Africa, and it's incredibly cruel. Because you see a child who, who looks like they are five years old, but they're 11. They look normal, but the child is 11 years old, and they look like they're five. And the mental. Uh, Cognitive growth is also hampered. Benefits to the community and the economy, increased community awareness and interest about purchasing local foods uh, served. There's increased community awareness, increased economic activity, and, the, and the, the, the information I got from the National Farm to School Network says, for each dollar invested into a farm to school, it stimulates 2.16 of the local economic activity. So there's some uh, off, where you transact that business, you're creating more business. Uh, improve household sec food security, Ms. Ray reference, the kids are eating better, they're healthier, they're learning better. Uh, for every job created by local school districts purchasing local foods, additional economic activity creates another 1.67 jobs. Who's the economist? I see one economist, and he can figure it out, help me figure it. This is not art, although growing vegetables can be artistic. This is a, this is a pak, pak choy that uh, we've, an Asian vegetable that we've introduced to some of our markets. Benefits to farmers, average of 5% increase of income to individual farmers from farm to school sales, uh, increased market di diversification, opportunities for processing. There is some, you could, if you get a chopper, you can, you can chop carrot stick, take your carrots and chop it into carrot sticks and put it in a, uh, maybe an eggshell and take it into the school and it's not a tremendous investment, but it's getting you a little further along in your profitability, right? Uh, grow a collaboration or cooperatives, supply institutional marketing. The last bullet is where we are right now. It's the economic interface for small farmers. 
they can organize themselves effectively into cooperatives, business cooperatives, not handouts, not uh, subsidized, although we might have to subsidize a little bit to get started. But what we really want is a co-op that can stand its ground economically. And uh, one of the big, within sight of co-ops, is operating these food hubs. The food hubs where all the food from the farmers are brought in for aggregation uh, and assembly and packaging and labeling. We feel that co-ops should be able to do that. Okay, I'm gonna go to Seven Harvest now. Uh, the rest of my presentation is gonna be visual. And I um, hope you're thinking with me. High Tunnel, this is, uh, this is now. What you're seeing is what we have in the high tunnel right now. Uh, so you got, uh-oh, well, let me see. This is spinach. This is kale, green kale. Green kale is one of the most popular leafy vegetables today it, all across the country. Kale smoothies. Kale, the miracle food. It's one of the oldest leafy crops, and there's so many varieties. Uh, but it'll grow out, it'll germinate in two or three days in a high tunnel, and you probably have a, a marketable stand in about three to four weeks. And then we've been picking this since November, this, this particular row here. Nice to have, in the old days, they had those little small doors and you were bringing always a lot of equipment and, and, and inputs into the house. Now we have these big open doors, roll up doors that makes it a lot easier to get in and out of the house. You can even drive a tractor in here and do some field cultivation. Okay, that's just a close up of the kale. Doesn't that look good? You think some kids from school would eat that? Okay. And that's another stand, it's got to go like this, see that? I, c I couldn't turn that around, <laughs> I tried. Okay, that's a long shot of the high tunnel. This is a 30 foot wide, 72 feet long high tunnel. Uh, cost me about 7,500. The material itself is probably about 6,000 but with the labor and assembly. And um, this is from a guy named Cornelius II in Mound Bayou, Mississippi, who's approved by the state to put in uh, high tunnels in Arkansas. Um, he's a, he's a, the only African-American farmer I know, uh, manufacturer of these. He, he actually manufactures the parts. And, um, okay, this is some of my old greenhouses. Remember I said greenhouses have mechanical heating and cooling. So this technically is a greenhouse, technically. Um, I don't wanna go too much into this, but this, this history has changed. These are the original houses that Diane and I did back in the mid 90s. The only thing that's changed is that they used to be attached houses. But we, we were out of the country and a storm came and the snow load collapsed. So we had to repair and we had to separate them. You didn't probably need to know that, but. Um, right here, this is, uh, can anybody tell me what that is, that row? Greens, yes. What kind of greens? Mustard. Where's the mustard at? <laughs> the mustard's over here, turnips over here. Mustard, turnip. Uh, I just wanted to compare how they would grow side by side and which would grow faster and all of that. And I think in a week, they're ready to harvest. Okay, and we started them in, uh, late December. 
And it helps when you get a few warm days and you have sun coming through that house, things really jump. And the thing about a high tunnel or uh, a, uh, I see you. <laughs> the thing about a high tunnel or a, is that it, it's more labor intensive. So you gotta be out there more frequently. Uh, but, you know, if you want more product, you wanna extend your growing season, I technically think that the future of agriculture is going to require us growing under plastic to maximize the supply that we can generate and to make us more profitable. And I think that this is a, a nice, I think a group of young people could construct these things, they could run them, and they can make money, a lot of money, with these high tunnels. And I'm going to try to promote that as much as possible. All right, let me see. This just quick. This is the roll. This is the handle that rolls up the sidewall. These are the houses. Uh, this is a little hoop house. We built this ourselves with with a little farm uh, community labor. And right now we have four rows. We have two rows of uh, kale a roll of spinach and a roll of chard in, that, in this little house and it, it's, just, it's just germinating. Okay, this is growing in the summer. Things are a little open. We have a shade cloth to cool things down over here. And it's, it's uh, everything is just tremendously faster, it's hot. So you definitely have to get in there early in the morning, late in the evening. Uh, and we, these are some of the future farmers. These guys don't farm over here, but they real interested in farming. So they came out to help us build a table, one of our growing tables for our salad mix. This is me <laughs> and I'm, uh, Harvest, I'm packing out spinach in those containers for an upscale grocery store that we work with in Memphis. And we have our scale. I just wanted to just show you that you gotta have stainless steel. This is our walk-in cooler back here. We haven't quite got that hooked up yet, uh, but we will before the summer. And that's the pack house. Looks like somebody could live in there, but um, but that's our pack house, and, and this is an, uh, right after we have finished harvesting, uh, packing our spinach for the day. And that's some more summer growing, some of the chard that Dr. and Julie and I talk about all, all the time. Very hardy crop, can grow well in hot months as well as cold months. And um, some of that is peppers here, right in here. And then you see the shade cloth better. You need to get a, a, a good percent shade cloth. The trick is not to get too much light out of your house because you need light, but you need to cool it down. And this is just our office, our humble office, and our pack house. And a pack house looks more better than the office, but anyway. <laughs> uh, that's the story. So uh, a little Q&A. This is the end of it. Thank you, Dr. Collins. Give a round of applause. Yes, sir. Are you able to grow tomatoes during the winter with no pollination? How you, how you with no to, pollination? You don't have the bees or something to pollinate. How do you manage that? You got you to gotta get your plants started before the winter. But to hold them through the winter, you need heat. You need to heat the houses. So you don't, you don't grow tomatoes during the winter? No, but we're thinking about it. We Sorry. we. We think that there's a good market and we're gonna test it for off-season tomatoes, local off-season tomatoes. When everybody's out. Uh, first we're gonna try tomatoes. We're gonna take it one step at a time. Yes, yes sir. Just, just a quick addition. Most tomatoes are self-pollinated as long as you have just a little bit of breeze in there, some kind of way, uh, you will get some. Sure. Yeah. 
Jeff Cummins. Yes, sir. Uh, you get in the USA assistance with that uh, hoop No, but but I am on the next hoop. <laughs> okay, that's a trick question. Look, I got I got I got that. Uh, I've studied the USDA. We are using we we have been approved for a car share. There's my NRCS representative who's working with me. We got approved for a high tunnel, and we're going to put in the biggest, a bigger one. I try to do a 30 by 96, and um, so you can get the cost share through Equip with Natural Resource Conservation Service. And if you want to cover your upfront costs, because all USDA programs are reimbursable, so before you can, so when you put, you can get a loan. You can go and get a micro loan from Farm Services uh, Agency to help you get in your your high tunnel. The only thing is, you don't want to spend the money. You want to pay it back as soon as you you get the money from NRCS. Okay. Hey, well, we do apologize, folks, but we're out of time. We apologize for that, uh, Dr. Collins. You're gonna be around uh, yeah. during the lunch, mm -hmm. and so is Mrs. Rayford. And Mrs. Rayford, we want to apologize to you for not being able to use your presentation on the projector. So, but with that being said, folks, uh, let's give them a round of applause. Both great job.